Oh, there, there you go. go. There you go. All right, cool. Good. All right. So I'm going to pick up where we left off today, which is around the very end of that first phase that we were talking about. So that's for 1945 to 1953. Um, let me just go over like the last bit of stuff that I was talking about so that we're kind of clear on it. I told you that the first portion of containment came to an end in 1949 because three significant things happened in 1949 and 50. What were they? There were three, you could say there were like three L's for the United States side of the Cold War. What was what was one? Oh, Mao. All right, so Mao defeats Shang, that means that we lost communist China, and that's a huge win for the Soviet-directed international communist side, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Russia gets their own atomic bombs. Russia gets their own bombs, which means our atomic monopoly is gone, and they've got conventional superiority. Okay, and North, and North Korea invades South Korea. Okay, because there was a kind of agreed upon dividing line of North and South Korea when it got liberated from the Japanese, and they made the boundary along what they call the 38th parallel. All right. By the time they both sides realized that there wasn't going to be an election that was ultimately going to unify the peninsula, the North took it upon themselves. And of course, at that point, the United States thinking is that anything that's being directed in a communist way is coming from Moscow. So whether it was from Pyongyang or however you pronounce that, um, the capital of North Korea, um, South, the fact of the matter is, is that the, the Soviet Union is now making its move in Asia. They thought it was going to happen in Europe. They were able to contain Europe but now they're moving on to a different sphere and the United States is going to have to bring game if they want to play. So far, the United States hasn't done anything except provide aid, rebuilding and reconstruction money, provide some tacit support. Um, they've joined some entangling alliances. We talked about the fact that NATO was ultimately an offshoot that brought a whole bunch of countries together um, to, in order to offset a potential aggressive move by the Soviet Union. But now it's 1949 to 1953 and the very end of it. Now the United States gets into what they call militarized containment. All right. And that means a couple of things. One, I talked about NSC 68. That is a National Security Council memorandum uh, that more or less suggested that there was going to have to be a rapid buildup of the United States' military capabilities. We're going to have to expand defense. We're going to have to take over more bases. We're going to have to do forward operations. We're going to have to build up our conventional troop strength. All of those things are part of a package that ultimately militarizes containment. The second thing um, was that the United States started working on a super. All right, this is, they called it the H-bomb, but it was supposed to have much higher detonating capacities than the bombs that they dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the Soviet Union have their version of the bomb, now we have to have a bigger bomb. And ultimately that kind of cycles into the 1960s where there's a huge arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. And then the third thing is we actually landed troops to protect South Korea against the North Korean invasion. So that means that the United States, five years after we had just left World War II, which is probably the most significant commitment that the United States has made militarily in its history. All right, so now they're, they're five years later, now they're in some place in Asia uh, fighting what, what really a, a remote, really kind of amounts to what they call a proxy war. We're not fighting the Soviet Union, but we think that the Soviet Union is backing the people that we are fighting. All right, so. There's a whole bunch of stuff that kind of goes along with that. Okay. Um, this is just some stuff that I wanted to make sure that you guys were familiar with um, because it really guides the Cold War quite a bit. The first thing is called the Munich analogy, and then the second is called the domino effect. And it means that there pretty much is a caretaking approach um, to foreign policy for the United States. It doesn't matter if a Republican is in charge, it doesn't matter if a Democrat's in charge, neither side wants to be in a position where they are regarded as soft on communism. 
okay? And perhaps it's a lesson that was learned by the British and the French consistently appeasing Hitler during the 1930s and then living to regret that. So the Munich analogy is if North Korea takes South Korea and we just kind of say, yeah, well, we don't really want to go out there and defend that soil. Uh, that's going to be a real expense for us. Then a couple of things happen. We've just more or less kind of conditioned ourselves to say it's okay. And then that will only engender the, the aggressive group to keep on further aggression. Okay, so that's one of the things. All right, the Munich analogy is we just lost China. Now you want to lose Korea? All right. And then the third one is called the domino effect. And the domino effect is literally anybody that's played dominoes. If Korea falls, then the next domino comes. And then before long, we realize that the Soviet Union is setting up operations in San Francisco. All right. So we got to stand our line right in the sand and say, you will go no further. That's what the containment policy was. And we are willing to put troops on the ground to make sure that Soviet Union directed communism does not expand. Okay. The other part of it is called international communist monolith. This is a theory. All right. And I've pretty much described it to you all day. And what does that mean? And it's unfortunate because it really dragged us into some pretty bad situations throughout this Cold War era. What do you think it means? Well, it's kind of like the people within the USSR were doing like socialism like within a nation, or at least that was what Stalin said, right? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, everyone else was kind of looking at the USSR and saying, oh, like they want international communism. Yeah, they believed ultimately in the ideology that communism would be exported abroad and that it would turn into a worldwide revolution. That means that the, the idea that the Soviet Union would ever be satisfied as some traditional power with like an increase in their territory, that doesn't happen here because it's an ideology that's consistently expanding and sees capitalism as a really a, as an ideological threat. So defeating capitalism wherever it is, is the ultimate goal. And that it won't stop until it's accomplished that goal. And it also clouds the thinking into assuming that any state could have a communist government or could have a communist leading leader or political you know, structure that is not controlled by the Soviet Union. It's, in, it's impossible to be able to divorce those ideas. So it doesn't matter where it is. Ultimately, the belief is that Moscow has sent agents. Those agents have met with those, uh, those left-leading you know, people in where, whatever state it happens to be. Uh, this is where they've chose to play the next game. If we're not up to the task, Munich analogy, domino effect. All right. And that it is a global struggle. The only thing is, is that the Soviet Union believes the same thing about the United States that if we get involved in any kind of theater, whatever it happens to be, we are this capitalist you know, conglomerate that is ultimately spreading its tentacles out and looking for a capitalist takeover of the world. So their posture becomes defensive against what they regard as the United States being the benefactor of European imperialism from the 19th century. The British and the French are no longer strong enough to continue to play the role that they once did, so the United States is gladly going to take on the mantle and try to plant its flag all over the world. And so that mutual distrust sort of becomes the game. All right? Instead of like rational people saying, yo, I mean, let's, let's be real about this. What do you guys really want? You know, and I think, unfortunately, they missed a lot of opportunities. Okay. Um, just some other stuff that you guys should be familiar with from U.S. history, things like the Alger Hiss trial, things like the Rosenbergs uh, and the investigation of the Rosenbergs, things like McCarthyism. Is everybody familiar with Joseph McCarthy, the senator from Wisconsin that holds up the thing in his hand and says, in my hand I hold the list of you know, whatever name or number he comes up with that day of communists operating in the State Department. And then everybody is running around, and it becomes, it literally becomes what, um, what the witchcraft trials were, all right? Except you're not burning anybody at the stake, all right? That's really the only difference. 
But if you are a communist leading person, or if you had showed up, you know, as some young kid at a rally, um, maybe you're trying to impress a girl and you ended up showing up at the rally. That was one of the stories that was associated with Alger Hiss. All right. Um, that that is ultimately going to cloud you for the rest of your life. And then you got to come to a hearing, and then those hearings become, in their own sort of way, like the show trials that Stalin had in the 1930s, where you've got a spotlight on you, and they're saying, were you or were you not a, you know, or are you or are you not a communist sympathizer? And it's literally on you that once you've been accused, you're really not getting past it. And so if there's movie directors, if there's university professors, um, if, I don't know, they showed up at one of my things earlier in the year when I was talking about Marxism, the fact that I probably even talked about Marxism, and there was a paper trail to suggest that I was talking about Marxism, even in a favorable way, there might be somebody that says, you know, you need to investigate this person. Yes? So the theory behind, like, accusing one single person of them thinking of socialist, <coughs> Marxist, like, ideas... They think they're plotting to like make deals with other people to eventually like make the Yeah, I mean it kind of grows on that. And then I mean like any type of witchcraft thing, if you are if you are associated in any way, or if you have a grudge that you want to carry out against, I don't know, a competitor for a job, or just like an old enemy or adversary, that would be the easiest way to, to, to see their undoing. You know, in the nineteen, the early nineteen fifties, is to accuse them of being sympathetic to communist ideas. So only, like, so they're only accusing people, getting people in trouble because they're thinking about like being sympathetic towards communism. Yeah, or they, like I said, they they attended a rally when they were young, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're like active agents working in the United States. But that's ultimately what was created was this belief that there was, the Soviets had been planting all these people all over the place um, and kind of acting on it, all right? And yeah, I mean, it ended up ruining a lot of people's careers, all right? Uh, particularly in education, but also, you know, there was, there was, it was a really big thing in Hollywood, all right? And they called it blacklisting or whatever, but then they couldn't get jobs anymore. They couldn't direct, they couldn't write, they couldn't act in movies because they were accused of being communist. Okay, yeah. Uh, is there like, I feel like we're learning a lot about like the same stuff coming from a push, uh, like the Cold War through mm -hmm. the eyes of the US. Yeah. In the Euro curriculum, do we learn, is there any more stuff about like the Cold War? I ways? mean, we'll get to it at least in, in terms of its hot spots, and we are going to kind of devolve out of this like pretty quickly so that we're looking at more European oriented stuff. But I told you guys the other day that once we hit the Cold War, it's kind of difficult to divorce this from what's going on, because it is impacting every one of the European states, because they're kind of aligned in this story. But every, yeah, every European history textbook and every European history cur curriculum that I've seen, when it's the Cold War, yes, the lead actors are the US and the Soviet Union, and everybody gets kind of tangled up in the ride. So, yeah. So, like the big main countries in Europe at this point, like Britain? They're, they're falling into one camp or the other. Okay, and like I said the other day, like the Marshall Plan and the NATO and a lot of that stuff, they kind of align those countries to determine which side they were ultimately going to be on. And if they were on the Soviet side, that's called the Eastern Bloc. If they were on the U.S. side, that was the Western Bloc. Okay. All right. Um, and what was the epicenter? Berlin. Where they're literally staring at each other. Yeah, Berlin. Berlin, Germany. And we talked about that. Okay, um, so yeah, a lot of this is a push review. There's no doubt about it. The next thing that we were looking at is this 54 to 58 period where things are, there's like a thaw. Uh, and the reason why is because A, the Korean War, they finally settled that. Um, you know, there is a truce. It ended up like kind of ending where it started. Okay, the second thing is, and the biggest reason is that Stalin's dead. Okay. Um, and a lot of people believe that, you know, because Khrushchev, the person that ultimately replaces Stalin, um, is kind of critical of that phase of Soviet history, that they saw a space opened up uh, where maybe Khrushchev was going to allow Eastern Europe to breathe a little bit. 
Okay, and we will kind of get into that, but there was also some fig leaves that were passed out that said, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union have been really kind of at each other's throats here for about seven or eight years. Maybe we need to kind of step back and see if there's some things that we can agree upon. Okay, so they call this the doctrine of peaceful coexistence. All right, and that there was a Western dialogue. Um, we'll talk about it more when we get to Khrushchev, but Khrushchev even allowed for his own, some of his own people uh, to be a little critical. All right, and included a couple of really leading literary figures. Uh, one of them's name was Boris Pasternak, who wrote a book called Dr. Zhivago. All right, um, and then there was another fellow by the name of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote a book called the, a Day in the Life of Ivan Denosovich, and then he wrote one called The Gulag Archipelago. And they were both um, really, really, you know, kind of a, a pretty good account of what it was like to be under Stalin's rule. Um, and very, very kind of untainted in terms of what they were saying about it. It was a very honest portrayal of how brutal it was to be part of that, that period of history. Okay. Um, but we'll get to it in just a second. Um, after 1958, and so there's not a lot that goes on in that period, at least related to the Cold War. And then the 58 to 62 period is probably the most famous period of the Cold War. And so I just want to hit a couple of things here. Are you all familiar with the U-2 spy plane? Okay, that was supposed to be the culminating thing where Khrushchev and Eisenhower had planned to meet in Paris and they were going to have this big conversation about how they could try to find it, kind, of, kind of coexist. And the U-2 spy plane was shot down over like Soviet airspace. Um, and, you know, I mean, it became kind of an international incident and it ultimately sabotaged the peace summit that they were supposed to have. All right. Um, Khrushchev had to take a hard line. Um, he w there was like actually a little battle that was going on between the Soviet Union and China, and Mao said, you know, you kind of lost your, your edge a little bit. So this was kind of his way of saying to the Soviet, you know, like at least the communist people that he was strong. Um, but that, that, was, that subverted a, an effort to tr try to get together. Then you had the overthrow in Cuba. Okay, which was New Year's Day of, or New Year's Eve of 1959, um, and Castro's forces overthrow what really was a puppet government uh, that was set up by the United States. The U.S. has been in Cuba since the Spanish-American War, and the leadership that they had in place was very, very friendly. Go watch Godfather too. Really, really explains these ideas, but the the relationship that existed with Cuban leadership prior to 1958 uh, was very, very American business friendly, um, but also created ridiculously. Um, I forgot the term but huge income disparities between an average Cuban and then the people that were kind of pro-business. So left-wing revolution, Castro overthrows Batista. Now the United States is freaked because remember, all communist revolutions point of origin is Moscow. All right, so um, the U.S. plans this invasion. And it was right at the end of Eisenhower's administration and Kennedy had just come into office um, and then it got, it just kind of, it was a disaster, All right? Cubans, you know, ended up capturing a bunch of soldiers. It was, it was a mess. So they weren't able to successfully invade Cuba to have their little coup d'etat or whatever the case was going to be. Um, but Cuba's kind of nervous now. Like, who says they're not going to continue to do this? you got all these Cuban exiles that are upset. You've got all these CIA operatives that have gotten a whole list of things that they want to do to try to take out Cuba or take out Castro. Uh, they had this thing called Operation Mongoose in place where they were actually thinking about making another move. So Cuba was a little bit nervous, and then, yeah, now they're out talking to the Soviet Union and said, we need some help. And then, of course, that spirals into the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we actually you know, took photographs and saw missile silos and all of that stuff, and it was very clear that the Soviets were providing missiles to Cuba, and Cuba's, what, 90 miles away from you know, the mainland United States, 
So hell no. Um, and during that week, it was probably the closest thing that you're ever going to see to a nuclear war. Um, we had put up a blockade. Literally, the Soviet ships are kind of marching through. And if they crossed the blockade line, we were going to launch. All right. And if that happened, it was, you know. And we had some hawks that were pretty excited about the prospects, which is crazy. Um, but it was kind of like one of those where Kennedy and Khrushchev probably had their nightgowns on and their curlers in and said, oh my God, this is really scary. What should we do? And then had a conversation about it and decided that, you know, hey, quietly, you know, we'll take our missiles out of Turkey. You take your missiles out of Cuba. It's all good. But the fact that the Khrushchev had to stand down kind of, the hardline communists within his own party said, like, you're not up for the job anymore. So eventually he ends up losing power in 1964. But it really was the closest thing. All right. The only other thing that's in that list is the Berlin Wall. Is anybody familiar with that or where that started from? No, wait, well. The Wall. We talked about, today in class, we talked about the Berlin airlift and then the, you know, the Berlin blockade, but we didn't talk about the wall. The wall's not created until 1961. And the reason why is because all of these folks from East Germany were flooding into West Berlin and then kind of matriculating into West Germany. It's pretty embarrassing, you know, for communism, you know, if... You know, the, the, if you're trying to compare these two worlds and say that this one's superior to this one, if it's so superior, then why are all these people, you know, using the access point to get out? All right, so finally there was a, a decision made, and the United States decided that at this point they weren't going to get involved in it, uh, but they constructed this concrete wall. Yes, walls are part of history. Um, and um, that becomes, I mean, it really is the symbol of the Cold War. If there is one, it's a physical symbol. Because on one side is communism, on one side is capitalism, one side the Soviets are supporting, one side the U.S. is supporting, and there's literally a concrete wall in the middle of the city. All right? And uh, it's going to be there until 1989. And when we say the Cold War is over, we usually look at the point where the wall comes down. Okay, so it, it is symbolically in every way um, the, the kind of the centerpiece of the Cold War. All right, some other stuff that you may not know. Um, obviously, we know about the nuclear arms race. It had gotten so insane in the 1960s that the arsenals were so large on both sides that they could have destroyed the Earth like four times. There were so many missiles, so many warheads that were on both sides that... It was, I mean, it was just kind of a dangerous place, but they're also spending billions of dollars on it, you know, in order to maintain those arsenals, to come up with some fiction, like, we're going to have first strike capability, okay? And then you get into all that stuff, you know, the massive, you know, retaliation and mutually assured destruction and all of the things that kind of go along with conversations about nuclear war. Um, but... You know, every time you think about somebody being able to push that button, the arsenal is larger. You know, and you literally could say this is the end of the civilized world if anything ever happened. And that's kind of a scary prospect. Um, okay, just some other stuff that's kind of in here. Um, just Cold War stuff. I mean, you've heard of things like ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. ABMs are anti-ballistic missiles. You've heard of MAD, the acronym. We talked about domino effect and Munich analogy. How about Sputnik? What is um, MAD? What is MAD? MAD means mutually assured destruction. Like if there was ever to like a nuclear armed state to engage against another nuclear armed state, it would be the end of those states. Okay. So it's literally saying mass suicide. Okay. And that's, that's hard. I mean, that's the, the idea is, who is mad enough? Like, who's crazy enough, like psychotic enough to want to ensure the destruction of an entire state? Or maybe more. I don't know. 
Um, how about Sputnik? What was important about Sputnik? Because there's not a single thing that happens in the Cold War that isn't ultimately rationalized under Cold War lenses. You guys heard of Sputnik? Yeah. yeah. All right, what is it? Yeah. First satellite launched into orbit and it came from the Soviet Union. Yeah. Which means what? If you're the United States policymakers, the Soviets are winning the race to space. So we need NASA, we're going to go to the frickin' moon, I mean anything else, but they're winning, we can't let them win, so now we have to win. And now we're going to put a whole bunch of money into racing to space. And if they got to, to the moon, then we're getting to Mars. And if they get to Mars, we're getting a frickin' Jupiter. Alright, but we're going to win. And then the Olympics. Okay, up in, I mean, most people don't realize this because you didn't grow up in this time, but I can tell you that one of the greatest sports moments in American history occurred in 1980. Oh, when we beat them in hockey? Yes. Not only, not just for the gold medal, this was the semifinals before the gold medal. All right, but most people would say that is like the greatest sporting event in American history was us beating the Soviet Union in hockey. Okay, and I remember it vividly when it happened because everybody in my neighborhood was out in the middle of the driveway, like, you know. They used to have these really stupid iron-on shirts, and they'd have this goofy dude, and he'd have his finger up, like, saying, F Russia. All right, because things were really intense in 1980. They were involved in Afghanistan. Uh, we were going to boycott the Summer Olympics. Everything was clouded in this idea, like everything down to whose gymnastics team is better is ultimately a determination on which civilization is superior. Okay, it's crazy, but that's how it was. All right, and if you don't believe me, rent Rocky Ford tonight. Um, okay, proxy wars, is everybody familiar with these? The first so-called proxy war was the Korean War. Um, that one was pretty clear. The one that they definitely got wrong was Vietnam. Okay, but they regarded that again as a proxy war. The fact that the leader in North Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, was you know a communist, was left-leaning, means that he's directed by Moscow. Without even understanding Ho Chi Minh's story, or the fact that he was a nationalist before he was ever a communist, the fact that he was considered a liberator for Vietnam, none of that mattered. What mattered is Munich analogy, domino effect, if Vietnam falls to communism, then the next thing falls to communism, and then Japan's vulnerable, and then et cetera, et cetera, and then we get embroiled in like a 20-year conflict as a result, okay? And probably, you know, changed the way that people viewed political leadership forever, okay? Um, there's a lot of other ones that you can point to. Nicaragua, El Salvador, Angola, I mean, you name it, there was a bunch, okay? But any kind of state that was, you know, having an election that ultimately could determine a left-leaning candidate to a center-right-leaning candidate um, was ultimately considered a Cold War thing. And the Soviets would back their side and we would back the other side uh, and we kind of played these things out. And sometimes we had troops on the ground and sometimes we didn't. In Vietnam we had half a million troops on the ground. Okay. Any questions about this so far? That's a pretty, this is a pretty much review for most of you. Okay. Does any, anybody have any questions before we move on to the next thing? Who has the power to launch this? Uh, the President of the United States. Can anyone intervene? <laughs> Apparently not. I mean, I don't know enough about it, but I am of the opinion that the ultimate determination is the President. And I'm hopeful that there's somebody that has some kind of rationality that would be able to countermand that order. But we were under, yeah, I mean, we were under every, we are under every belief, at least up until now, that the president could ultimately, he's the one that has the codes. He's the one that can ultimately launch. And, I mean, honestly, if somebody had the ability to, it doesn't matter if it was Trump, Obama, anybody else. If anybody ever pushed that button, 
before they push it, I hope somebody would shoot them. All right, because they're ultimately sealing the death of like a billion people. Now, that's not a good thing, I would say. All right, we're going to move on to a new set of notes. Um, okay. So if you go into uh, the folders, and like I said, they're pretty well organized at this point. Um, well, let me just kind of take you through the paces of this. Uh, my drive, Euro Unit 10. So the second set of notes that we're going to look at is this thing called the Western Renaissance. All right, so it will say AP European History Western Renaissance. And those are the notes that we're going to go to next. Um, and this is kind of the beginning of this. Uh, no, that's the wrong set. Hang on. Is the Brussels Pact yeah. a part of NATO? The Brussels Pact was the thing before it became NATO. It was just like it was nations within Europe that were already starting to find ways that they could work mutually. And eventually they ended up tagging a whole bunch of other nations. I mean, we had Scandinavian countries, we had Canada and the U.S., and then ultimately it becomes NATO. So, yeah, it's kind of like the embryo that grows into NATO. Okay. Um, okay. Hey, bud. Welcome. So here's the second part. Um, and this is the part where if... I had stopped teaching about 10 years ago, the end of this narrative would have been glorious. But this is the one that's changed, okay? And it's, here's the thesis of really this, this set of notes. It says, um, a couple of key features that revealed the Europeans, particularly in Western Europe, to be students of history. The first was that they were not bound to repeat the mistakes that they had made in the past. Meaning that period from 1919 to 1945, they learned something. All right. The U.S. not only learned that they needed to not drop the ball like they did at the end of the Paris Peace Conference, not ratifying the treaty, not joining the League of Nations, not involving itself well enough into making sure that Europe was stable economically. All right. And then even after the Depression, not losing their jizz on it, and sticking with it and making sure that they had created enough mutuality that they were going to try to get out of that recession or that depression together instead of turning inward and nationalistic. Because it sealed the, it sealed the deal for a lot of up-and-coming liberal democracies. They had no chance to make it. All right. So there's a couple of features in this. One, the U.S. we know is playing a much different role after 1945 than they played after 1919. That's what the Marshall Plan is about. That's what the Truman Doctrine is about. That's what the Berlin Airlift is about. And that's definitely what NATO is about. Okay, it's the first time the United States has been involved in something where they said, we will be in militarily involved if this thing happens. All right? Maybe our first ever entangling alliance. But the second part of this story, which is also good, is that the Europeans are doing for themselves. All right? And what they learned was that going inward, seeing everybody on their boundaries as an adversary, and in being involved in state-to-state -state conflict, wasn't getting Europe anywhere. They had been through two devastating wars that killed somewhere in the ballpark of about 100 million people. So there was a hope that they might learn their lesson this time. And that's what ultimately happened. So here are the three subpoints. The US. Though, uh, though to fight the Cold War, that was their ulterior motive. But in order to win the Cold War, or to protect Europe in the Cold War, they committed themselves and vast resources to European reconstruction. If they did not, we talked about that earlier today, communism was surely would have been there to fill the void that was left behind after World War II. Liberal democracies don't do well in times of crisis. So if you can create economic prosperity, the case for longevity with liberal democracy usually follows. And at least the U.S. kind of figured that out this time. Okay? The second thing is the European governments developed extensive social welfare-oriented governments that adopted Keynesian economics and said, you know, we're, we're going to create deficits if we need to. But 
these group of people, they were predominantly Christian Democrats. If you read about West Germany, Italy, France, Belgium, a lot of these different states adopted what they called Christian Democratic parties that adopted a form of what we call mixed socialism. All right, They became really bona fide welfare states, um, which is an alternative. Because if we don't steward this thing, from like the center or the center left, then it could go extreme left, you know, and we've already seen what extreme right looks like. Right? The third thing is, is that nationalism that dominated the pre and post World War I era was replaced with a dialogue and cooperative involvement of all of these states, including ones that you would have never suspected would be able to get along. The French and the Germans. Not the East Germans, but the West Germans. But any German, it would seem odd, considering that the French had to deal with, what, three invasions from Germany since 1870? But after 1945, they were the ones that kind of spearheaded a cooperation. Because if we said confrontation has never been really good for either of us. All right? So that was the cool part about it. And eventually, the thing that we know to be right now, the EU, which is being systematically dismantled, or potentially could be, was the brainchild of a whole bunch of post-World War II narrative that said, we need to come together on things. Politics, economics, whatever else. But we're stronger together than we are apart. And they got that. It was kind of like... For a while, we believed Europe to be the wise old sage. Like, even as early as 2003, when the U.S. was committing itself to fighting that war against Saddam Hussein, and a lot of the European states said, we're not getting behind this. There was a lot of narrative at that time that said, Europe is like the grandfather that is talking to the hot-headed dad or whatever, our son, that's saying, dude, we've been there, Okay. And right now you have to understand that you don't always pull the trigger. You don't always step on the gas. That was 10 years ago, guys. You know, 15 years ago, I guess now. But that would have been the narrative that I could have said. If I was teaching this class 15 years ago, which I was doing, that was the end of it. We could say, yes, Europe has taken on this grandfatherly role where, you know, they've been working together for 50 years and they look at all these idiot, hothead nationalists that are running around and saying, you should learn from us, yo. You know? But what are we getting now in Hungary? What are we getting in Poland? What are we getting in France? What are we getting in Great Frickin' Britain? Nationalism. Nationalism. Okay? Not in my backyard ultra-right politics. Like they're reverting back to the world that existed prior to the two gigantic world wars, and they're actually em embodying some of the, the characteristics of politics that brought them destruction. But they're gonna do it again, okay? And sadly, I mean, there's some racial tinge to it. Quite a bit of racial tinge to it, to be honest. And we'll talk about that, you know, certainly after the break a little bit more when we look at the contemporary stuff. But anyway, let's look at the good times. The good times here is, um, and all I'm doing is just kind of giving you a little, these are the people that were taking their seats um, in various West European governments uh, right after World War II. And I told you the Christian Democrats, or in Britain's case, the Labour Party, these are the folks that are kind of stewarding a lot of these folks' recovery. Marshall Plan money is bankrolling it too, but it's also Europe kind of doing for itself. And that's also a good thing. So Clement Attlee, this is Labor Party, and it's going to be an advancement of social welfare programs, and Britain has been pretty good about that. But it wasn't able to get them navigated through the 1919 to 45 period. Um, and certainly from 45 to 60, it seems like it's doing a little bit better. Okay. In France, a couple of powerhouses in the late 1940s. One was the premier, his name was Robert Schumann, who was a Christian Democrat, and his economic policy advisor, his name was Jean Monnet. Not Monet like Claude, but M-O-N-N-E-T. And they were the ones that ultimately kind of met with the West Germans and some of these other heads and started to build the apparatus which eventually becomes the European Union. 
in West Germany, which was created in 1949, like a, shortly after the whole Berlin thing. Um, the leader, the first real chancellor of West Germany, his name was Konrad Adenauer. And his economic advisor was a guy named Ludwig Erhardt. And these, uh, these two, Erhardt, Monet, Adenauer, and Schumann, more or less, they become the centerpieces of a dialogue that ultimately brought Europe together. Okay? Um, I've listed the leaders in Belgium, in Italy. Um, I've mentioned Spain and Portugal. They more or less kind of maintain the same leadership that they had prior to the war. They're really kind of non-factors, but at least they were, they were on, the, you know, on the playing field to say we're not really involved in Cold War politics, we're not in favor of one, we're not in favor of the other, they just kind of maintain their neutrality. Belgium and Italy, on the other hand, Christian Democrats, and that was going to keep them because I would say Italy in particular was vulnerable to a communist takeover. Remember, that was Mussolini. All right, so here's the early stuff, okay? First thing it says, partnerships with the U.S. and each other. We already talked about the Marshall Plan. Um, sometimes it's called the European Recovery Act or the European Recovery Package, but it was named after George Marshall, um, who was the one that created the policy. All right. Um, I wrote down, but rather than occupation of the Ruhr mentality, everyone is playing the part of European recovery. Okay. It's not, you know, where's my money, Brian, anymore. Okay. Um, eventually, this sort of thing creates a beginning, which is called the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. Okay. NATO is an offshoot, which says if we're going to start coming together economically, we're going to do it militarily as well, because the Soviets definitely propose a threat. All right. The first thing that begins the integration, European integration, which ultimately becomes the EU, is called the Schuman Plan, all right, named after Robert Schuman, the, the French premier. Um, and they decided that they were going to try to remove internal tariffs between the different states. All right? So in order to integrate their coal and steel production, they created what's called the ECSC, the European Coal and Steel Community. And you'll, you'll hear like the, the bare bones of this, because ultimately it's gonna grow into more than 20 actors, all right, by the time, you know, like the 2000s roll around. But the original six, the OGs, were West Germany, France, and then what they call the Benelux countries, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, and then Italy. And that those economies, at least in terms of coal and steel production, were going to be integrated. We're going to remove tariff barriers. We're going to allow the free flow of these very critical industries uh, among the six states. So now we've got trade partners. And if we're integrated and we rely on one another, then that makes us least likely to want to fight one another. Okay? The next logical extension of that is a general economic community. So why mess with just coal and steel? Why not just integrate our economies? So they created what's called the EEC. Before the EU, it was called the EEC, the European Economic Community. It was created in 1957. It's called the Treaty of Rome. So it's the original six that I mentioned. And then in 1973, Great Britain, Ireland, and Denmark joined. 81, Greece joined. 86, Spain and Portugal joined. Um, and now you have a pretty bona fide group that is tied their economic out, you know, outcomes or outlooks together. Okay? Um, and then some of the stuff that you know, eventually comes out of this is um, by the time we get to 1991, um, we've more or less got the plan in mind for the creation of the European Union. It was to take political, it was to take military, it was to take economic, and kind of put it all together in one, you know, kind of vast integrated network. All right, and it takes place in the Netherlands. It's called Maastricht, M-A-A-S-T-R-I-C-H-T. If you ever see that, that's what it's referring to. Ultimately, that was the plan that said, we've got all of these currencies, okay? We've got, you know, francs, and we've got marks, and we've got, 
you know, pounds and all of these other things, and we need to come up with one singular currency, the euro, um, that will kind of, that, that we can use, and it will eliminate a lot of problems. Okay? Um, so a lot of that happens between 1991 and 1993. The F point in these notes, um, it just says that every once in a while you'll see some nationalism that'll come out of the closet. All right. Initially, it was Great Britain. Believe it or not, they're back. Okay. But Britain was very reluctant to join the European Economic Community. And in fact, in the 1950s, they should have jumped in in 1949, but they waited because they're kind of like, I, I don't know. All right. And maybe that's just Britain being Britain. Because remember, the entire 19th century, Britain's kind of like, you know, we got our own thing going on. All right. Um, at that point, they had not yet really relinquished most of their empire, although they were moving in that direction. Um, so at first, it was Britain not wanting um, to join the EEC. And then when they wanted to join the EEC, then the leader in France didn't want them to join the EEC. And that was Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle was the leader in France in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, and he wanted to veto their entry. Okay, it's kind of like watching history repeat itself. Because if anybody's been paying attention, who's the leader in France right now? Macron. All right, Emmanuel Macron, right? Who is the most vocal person about the, the Brexit vote? Theresa May. Theresa May is trying to get the Brexit done. Okay, they want delays. It's, I mean, it's a mess, right? But the person that is speaking out against Britain and saying, let them sever, man. Why are we giving them another year? The hell with them. Who's that? Macron. Okay, so the, con the, like the, the animus that they have towards one another right now is the animus that they had towards one another in the late 50s and early 60s. Okay? And it's the oddest thing in the world to see France and Germany being like the wise old sages, considering where their history has been. All right. Yes. What is what is De Gaulle's uh, like reputation? Because I know, like, for instance, like the France isn't the Paris airport named after him. De Gaulle was the leader of what they called the Free French Movement during the war. Remember that when France was occupied, the people that were sympathetic to the Nazis were part of what they called Vichy France. All right? And the free French were operating in Britain, but they were also operating in Algeria. Okay? And the leader of the free French during the war uh, was Charles de Gaulle. And so the fact that he was kind of like their wartime hero, eventually by the time we get to the late 50s, and they were dealing with this Algerian fight that I'm going to talk about next, um, Charles de Gaulle was the one that they were going to call on. But Charles is kind of an old dude. I mean, he's kind of old school. And he was thinking more in French terms than thinking in European terms. All right, so he is kind of a hiccup on the radar screen, but he was nervous about the United States having way too much influence in Europe, nervous about Britain potentially getting into the EEC and then coming to dominate it. You know, um, there's a lot of stuff on to go. I see some hands up, yeah. Um, where does the European defense community and the Plevin plan come into this? I think very early. Uh, Okay, I think that a lot of that stuff was that it was germinating in the in the nineteen forties, the late nineteen forties. Okay, was it just like, was it France, like, and Britain making a pact, or like I was confused in, in the deal? Um, I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. I have to I have to go back and look at it, but I know that there was a lot of just kind of interplay between a couple of states that eventually grows into regional play among a lot of different states. Okay. So I think that's where it starts. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, not really. Okay, that's that's fair. All right, um, let's move on to the next thing then, um, which is decolonization. <coughs> All right, and then I've got one, I'll take a break, and then I've got one quick set of notes that I wanted to go over, uh, which is just to hit some stuff on, on Soviet Eastern Europe. Um, but the next section is decolonization. 
all right? And some of this is just refresher course on things you may know. In this case, it says the thesis is that the age of empire came to an end after World War II. Britain and France, as well as the rest of European colonial states, um, that's kind of over. So there was a point when almost the entire world, or a good se a section of the world, was controlled by about five or six powers. All right? And then after World War II, that's definitely over. Okay? Africa, Asia, the Middle East finally got the self-determination that they should have gotten after World War I, but this wasn't without many complications. The vacuum was unavoidably placed within the context of the U.S.-U.S.S.R. Cold War rivalry, a morsel of French reluctance, and we're going to talk about that, and as we know, the Middle East scene got rather complicated uh, with the creation of Israel in 1948. Okay, so we'll start there, um, because... A lot of the cases that, I mean, some of these, the transition is not too ornery, but in a lot of places it is ornery, and then this one is like existentially ornery, and that is the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, and where it was created, and it was created where there were leaders in Britain who had basically controlled that area by mandate when the Ottoman Empire crumbled at the end of World War I, that we're talking out of two sides of their faces. Okay? One, we know that because of all of the pogroms and the anti-Semitic rhetoric in the late 19th century, early 20th century, we have a leader by the name of Theodore Herzl, who is the founder of what they call Zionism, and said the reason why the Jews are constantly targeted is because they don't have a place to call their own. All right? And so there was this move um, to bring them back to um, this ancient place, which happened to be, you know, this region called Palestine. All right? And you have Muslims that are living in that region, and it is under Ottoman control. And eventually, when Britain cedes control, they seem favorable um, to this Zionist movement. It started with Theodore Herzl, it eventually becomes this fellow named Chaim Weizmann. Um, and it ultimately manifests in this thing called the Balfour Declaration. All right, a British foreign minister by the name of Arthur, Arthur Balfour, who more or less said, there is definitely going to be a plan for a Jewish homeland in this region. And when the Palestinian Arabs heard about it, uh, they were not too satisfied. Okay, and that there were clashes immediately, all right, in the late teens, early 20s, that kind of died down by the time the Nazi thing started, all right? And then it kind of like it deferred attention. It's almost like if you watch some of the clashes that potentially could have happened between Britain and Russia that ultimately got tabled because of the Napoleon thing. Yeah. Was Palestine like a state at that point? No. Oh. It was a subject, it was a subject to the Ottoman Empire. I thought it... Oh, they didn't okay. No, because two things were happening at the same time. Zionism was a movement to create a homeland for the Jews. But at the same time, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, and all of these other Arab states that were also part of the Ottoman Empire were looking for independence. One of the, excuse me, one of those happened to be the Palestinians. Okay? So some voices were saying, yeah, 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 Palestinian state, and then, yeah, 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 Zionist, you know, homeland, and all of those things, and they hadn't really worked it out, okay? And the fact that Balfour seemed to be moving in a direction towards the Jews and then kind of ignoring the Palestinian Arabs made the Palestinian Arabs nervous, and then there was a lot of tumult after World War I anyway, so there's going to be skirmishes, and then it all kind of got tabled, and the fact that the Holocaust happened, pretty much made most people's moral sens you know, sensibilities say, yeah, we got to find a homeland for, once these concentration camps and death camps are liberated, and we've got all of these folks that have survived literally a targeted genocide, we should have a place for them to go. All right. It doesn't satisfy the angst that still exists among the Palestinian Arabs that most likely are going to become refugees. All right? And they didn't commit the Holocaust. All right? And they're basically saying, you're like, you're planting a state in our backyard in something that you know, we've aspired to for, for years, decades, centuries. All right? 
And so, I mean, ultimately the British, and this is something that the British and the French both did, they couldn't handle things after World War II, all right? Because after the war is over and Britain, you know, is on, at least on the winning team, and it, it's sort of like we still have all of this empire stuff to deal with, Britain is exhausted. And they basically said to the UN, you guys figure it out. I, sh I mean, we talk too much, you know, you know what, in, in the Balfour Declaration. Now it's coming back to haunt us. There is this big concerted move to try to create a state for a homeland for the Jews. The Palestinian Arabs are pissed. The rest of the Arab community is pissed. What are we going to do about it? I'm just going to hand it off to the UN. Eventually, the United States gets behind um, th this thing um, that, oh, that was ultimately going to be created from the settlers that had been coming to that region since you know, the 1890s, that they would create this state that they called Israel. All right, yes. Wait, why was Britain in that area in the first place? Or why did they control Because it? of the mandate system. Remember that oh. after the Ottoman Empire fell, rather than giving liberation to all of these states that were asking for it, okay? I told you, this is, I mean, the stuff that happened in 1919 helps explain a lot of the <laughs> hatred now. Because the British and the French, rather than giving these folks self-determination because they weren't white or whatever, um, they eventually put them under mandate, which is just another form of colonialism. And then they never got to work it out. Okay? And then the United States, because they were worried about the Cold War and a whole bunch of other things, they were like, dude, we'll take care of it. Because all of these areas are vulnerable right now, and if we don't get involved and deal with the vulnerabilities, then all these states might flock to the Soviet Union. So now the U.S. jumps in, and they're like, oh, you guys are the new British. We get it. You're the bad guys. Oh, and also, you're supporting Israel. So we, everybody in the Arab states automatically is going to hate the United States. And then the Soviet jumps in and probably joins, you know, supporting the Arab states, thinking that they're going to get oil out of it, which they probably did. All right. But the U.S. ends up taking on, because they're fighting the Cold War, they end up taking on or wearing the hat that was handed to them by the British and the French. So they always get painted with this brush of, you're the new imperialists. You're the new ones that are setting up, you know, and we don't really do ourselves any favors when we put up all these businesses in places and extract a whole bunch of resources, all right? But a lot of it is whether we have good intentions or not, it doesn't matter because the stain of imperialism is already there. The stain of 1919, when they could have allowed all these states to self-determination or to self-determine, we didn't give it to them, all right? And now there's a lot of anger. And now you've added the creation of Israel, which seems like it, it just furthers what the Balfour Declaration had intended in 1917. Now they did it in 1948, and it was like obvious that there was going to be a war. Okay? How long did it take? A month? From a formal recognition of Israel to the Arab states all aligning together? Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and everybody else? to form, you know, a, a, an opposition and go to war against them, okay? There's a league that was formed in 1945. That, that league ultimately goes to war against Israel, okay? Who comes out victorious in all these wars? Israel, all right? They fought major skirmishes in 1948-49, then they fought again in 1967, and then they fought again in 1973. And a lot of the fights that they've had since the 60s have been about territories that they occupied after the original war. So let's look at what they got, okay? So they had this fight, okay? Then the Six-Day War, Israel is victorious. They took some rather contested territories. Maybe you've heard of some of them, like the West Bank. Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, the Sinai Peninsula. All right? If there was ever going to be a two-state solution, it would have been done in the late 40s, but there was a war, and Israel was, like, gaining some territory, maybe, to protect themselves. All right? 
but some of that territory was sacred territory, or it was contested territory, or it was ultimately going to displace some people um, that needed that territory. And the Palestinians ended up becoming the state without a state. Okay? And again, the Palestinians weren't the ones that committed a holocaust against the Jews. The Palestinians were somebody that the state kind of dropped on. And they were like, yo, wait a second, what about us? Weren't we the ones that also sent ambassadors and emissaries and everything else in the late teens? And said, where's our state? And we were ignored. Okay, that's basically how they felt about it. So, this fight isn't going anywhere. Most people believe that this is, the, you know, this is the the crisis of all crises. Okay, most everything centers around. I mean, how many times have you heard some politician in the last fifty years say, you know, we're going to provide a really, you know, sensible peace to the Middle East? Like, give me a freaking break! Are you kidding? Every sub every subsequent presidential administration thinks, you know, from, you know, Carter. You know, to, what is it, Jared Kushner? You know, it's like, oh yeah, we, we're going to solve this. We're going to come up with something that everybody's going to agree to. Now, let's move the capital. You know, that's a good idea. That's smart. Okay. Um, have you guys heard of Abdel Nasser? This was one of the few incidents during the Cold War where the U.S. and the USSR were on the same side. So it was in 1956, the leader um, of Egypt was this fellow named General Abdel Nasser, Gamal Abdel Nasser. All right? And he's beginning a lot of reconstruction projects in Egypt, and he's a nationalist. Remember, Egypt also was controlled by the British forever and ever and ever. And now they're free, and now they're doing their own thing. Okay? The move that he made was to nationalize the Suez Canal which is going to put a whole bunch of British and French investors on the defensive, and they're also worried about trade flows disrupting from the Persian Gulf. Okay, So on that occasion, Britain and France and Israel started to contest the idea that Egypt would nationalize the Suez Canal, and both the U.S. and the USSR said, stay the hell out of it. And in the history books, one of the things that they teach is, now everybody gets to see that the United States is ultimately determining what people act on and what people don't act on. And it also kind of signals that the, the old European states, the great powers in European history, especially the 19th century, early 20th century great powers, they're not great powers anymore. Okay, Britain and France can't do diddly if the U.S. doesn't support it. At least in nine in the nineteen fifties. Yes. And uh, what was the reason for the nationalization of the Suez Canal? It was their territory. I mean, that's that's the one thing. I mean, and I mean, if you want to go back in the history, I'm sure that Nasser could say, "Look, you screwed a whole bunch of puppet rulers into giving their shares away, and now all we're doing is we're taking back what's ours." Were they not getting any advantages from? Uh, international access to the Suez Not nearly the, the same economic advantages that the British and French investors were getting. And part of that was that we need to be able to build up economic vitality, which is one of Nasser's plans for his own people. That's what they also did one, it's called the Aswan Dam. It was a huge uh, construction project that he undertook. Because part of it was that, I mean, it was almost like a new deal for the Egyptians. You know, and it was a way to help them recover after the war, too. All right. But part of it was a little bit of a pissing contest. I mean, if we're being honest, you know, and it was Nasser sticking up for his, his country and his own territory, um, and it was his way of basically decolonizing or further decolonizing. All right. Um, okay. How about Iran? You guys got any kind of like just blow by blow on Iran? What would be important to know about Iran? It's like a couple of things. And this is a story that's often told. Okay? They had free elections in Iran. Okay? The leader that they had chosen was this fellow named Mossadegh. Okay? 
What's his problem? He's got Soviet influence. Huh? He's got Soviet influence. He's got Soviet influence. All right, he's got left-leaning sympathies. Like I said, it does. If he has Soviet influence, that's fine. But the other thing was, he was a popularly elected figure. Okay, just happened to be on the left. And the United States couldn't deal with that, so they and the CIA engineered a coup d'etat, overthrew him, and replaced him with a puppet. His name was Shah Reza Pahlavi. And the puppet did in Iran what Batista did in Cuba enriched himself at the expense of his own people. And eventually, it got so ridiculous, there was like billions of dollars of, of Iranian money that was in offshore accounts that was basically for the Shah's family. Okay? And eventually there was an overthrow. Um, there was a revolution in the streets of Tehran, and that happened in the late 70s. Um, but it also had a different taste to it. Uh, because it also involved what, what they call radical Islam. Like a more fundamentalist reading where you don't have like a secularized state, but you have sort of like a church-directed state. Okay, And so their leader that they recognized was this guy named Ayatollah Khomeini. All right. So not only did they like overthrow the Shah, but they wanted his assets. And the United States wasn't freely giving back those assets. And so they ended up taking American hostages in an embassy. This is something that I also remember because I was in like fifth grade, right? And every night in the news, it would be like day one of the hostage, or day four. Eventually, it was like 450 days that American, uh, the Americans were held hostage in Tehran. And they would show them with like blindfolds on and all this weird stuff. And um, it's kind of interesting because as soon as Reagan um, like took the oath, the oath of office, um, they ended up freeing him. Yeah. Is that where that the movie Argo was about that? Or Argo? I didn't see it, so oh, I don't know. know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, China, just real quick. Uh, the, the we talked about the loss of China and the idea that China is a communist state. Um, one of the views that we had that was wrong, you know, unfortunately we didn't know it was wrong, was that. Uh, Mao and Stalin hated each other, okay? When Khrushchev took over, Mao thought he was a chump, that they were kind of doing their own thing. Um, Mao actually uh, exceeded Joseph Stalin's body count. So Stalin was responsible for killing between 20 and 30 million of his own people. Mao was able to double the number. There's a lot of people that estimate that Mao killed between 50 and 60 million of his own people. Okay. There's a couple of programs. You know how like in Stalin's case it was like um, the collectivization, the five-year plans, and then it was the purges. Um, in China it was called the Great Leap Forward program, and then this thing called the Cultural Revolution. And the Great Leap Forward program was kind of like um, the collectivization stuff. And the Cultural Revolution was sort of like the purges, except the numbers were much bigger. Um, and in the 50s and the 60s, China was a very scary place to be. Okay. It all starts to change in 1976. Okay. And the leader in China, his name is Deng Xiaoping, but that's where he adopts what's called, in base, I don't know what it's called, but it looks like the new economic policy. We know China now is still considered a communist state, still is considered authoritarian politically, but has just exploded economically. And a lot of that stuff started in the late 70s. All right, so that now, which I think for the first time in modern history, uh, China's economic output has exceeded the United States' economic output. So they now have the largest economy in the world. Okay, but the beginning of that, because they were nothing in you know the 50s and 60s and early 70s, uh, they have exploded since then. Okay. India, anybody familiar with it? It's just the understanding that, you know, um, there's a lot of discussion. They believe, you know, that as far as decolonization is concerned, um, that Gandhi is considered probably like the face of decolonization um, simply because of the tack that he took. <coughs> 
I mean, if you've ever studied Gandhi, we know that he, he became a lawyer. We also know that he spent a lot of time um, in South Africa. There was a lot of, or uh, in Africa, there was a lot of Indian immigrants uh, that were fighting for rights in Africa. He spent about 20 years there. And eventually he also learned, um, you know, Henry David Thoreau and all that stuff uh, and adopted um, civil disobedience. Um, and really from you know the early 20s and the 30s, he was the, the figure uh, that was fighting against British colonialism. Um, and, you know, eventually he gets it. I mean, that Britain is, is ultimately gonna relinquish control. It's one of the first things after World War II that they relinquished control of uh, was India. Um, but it wasn't a smooth transition because there was an Indian National Congress that was created very early. I mean, before even Gandhi kind of appears on the stage, the Indian National Congress started in 1885. But there was also a Muslim you know, group that also formed. And at times they were partners, but then there was a divergence that kind of started um, right after World War I. So they weren't on the same page in terms of what they ultimately wanted. What Gandhi wanted a kind of multi-religious kind of we're going to all do it together sort of thing. Um, and the leader in uh, among the Muslim group, his name was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, um, wanted a state, wanted a Muslim state out of the former British colony. And eventually, you know, it, it ended up becoming that. And, you know, we know that Gandhi was assassinated and eventually there's a partition that took place, you know, in, in 47. And it, it was a mess, I mean, because you, were ha you had Muslims that were in predominantly Hindu areas. You had Hindus that were in predominantly Muslim areas. When they decided to create Pakistan in India, they said there's probably about 500,000 people that ended up dying in transit. All right. Um, reciprocal ethnic cleansing, I guess you could call it. And then at, at one time, Pakistan was actually separated in two states. They had Pakistan and then they had East Pakistan. And what did East Pakistan eventually become in like the early 70s? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. Let's talk some Vietnam. Okay. Uh, Indonesia, there was, uh, there was um, dictatorships. But they were our dictatorships, so we were cool with it. But they had a couple of leaders. One was Sukarno and one was Suharto. And they led uh, Indonesia for like three decades or three and a half decades. Uh, they were harsh dictatorships. Um, but I wrote, who cares, because they're not communist. So it, it makes them cool. Right. Um, as far as Indochina is concerned, um, I think I introduced Ho Chi Minh to you guys at the Versailles conference. Remember he was like a cook or a student or something like that. His heroes were like John Locke and Thomas Jefferson. All right. I mean, he was an, he, he loved enlightenment philosophy. I mean, he, he, he would have been a liberal Democrat if anybody like was nice to him, probably in Paris. Uh, but eventually he got communist training. Um, and when they, um, it was one of those weird things. Like after, like look, they were controlled by Japan. They, you know, they were under, always under somebody else's control. And then right after the, you know, they they were under French control when French took over into China in like the eighteen what sixties or seventies. Um, the French controlled them as a colony. Then Japan, when they took over a lot of Asia, ended up taking them over. And then afterwards, you're like, at this point, finally. <laughs> Vietnam becomes its own thing, you know, and Indochina, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, they become their own thing. Uh, but no, France wants their territories back. And this is real sad part about France. France, out of all of the countries, they wanted to hold on to their colonial power. Maybe it was because they got, you know, kind of by Hitler and that they were under somebody else's control. And this was their way of kind of like announcing that they were back you know, it's, it's pretty embarrassing to, like, get occupied in a week, you know, and maybe that was their way of kind of, I don't know, remasculinizing or something. I was to say, hey, look, we're still an empire, even though, I mean, like, Britain and others were kind of like, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. 
Fred's like, well, we're going to do it. And they had a couple of places that they tried to do it, and it was embarrassing. And it ultimately ended poorly. One was Indochina, um, and then the other was Algeria. Okay, um, Indo Algeria has probably created some of the the animus that they have now, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. Indochina ultimately became the United States looking at it as a Cold War problem, when in reality it was probably like an independence problem. All right, France tried to maintain control of it. Uh, they definitely did not want the French to be there. They formed this group that was called the Viet Minh that was made up of communists but also just you know, pro-Vietnam people. Uh, and eventually they fought the French. Um, and they, there was a huge battle that took place that the French, you know, they were kind of like trying to figure out what to do. And they were routed at this battle called Dien Bien Phu. Um, and then immediately after that, they have a conference and they make a really stupid decision. They said, hey, let's Korea this, you know, thing. And so, you know, the Korea, they did the, you know, 38th parallel. It's like, we'll kind of divide Vietnam. We'll find a parallel. Somebody give me a parallel. They're like, how about 17th? Yeah, 17th, that'll work. The North will be communist. The South will be uh, a government of our choosing. And the thing is, is the South didn't really want to be the South. You know, the majority of the people. But somebody's like, oh, I get to be like a, in a pro-U.S. backed regime. I could probably make some money off of that. So there's a guy that volunteers. His name is Go Jem. And Jem will become the leader of South Vietnam. And Ho becomes the leader of North Vietnam. And there were supposed to be elections. But once they saw the writing on the wall, they said, there's no way we're having these elections. Okay, so the U.S. is like, this is a Munich analogy, domino theory, blah, blah, blah. Let's support Go. But it was impossible to support him because, A, the people hated him. B, he was a Catholic living in a predominantly Buddhist country. All right, and it was, it was kind of a mess. But yet they held on to him for like, I don't know, almost eight or nine years. And in that time, he had more or less assured that there was going to be a number of South Vietnamese that were going to become part of a resistance. And that resistance became known as the Viet Cong. Okay. Anybody ever see the photograph of the, uh, the guy lighting himself on fire in the middle of the street? It's one of the seminal pictures um, from the Vietnam War. Nothing cooler than a good photograph of a Buddhist lighting himself on fire. If you haven't seen this picture, it's one of the most intense pictures. I'll save that. Okay, I'm gonna open it up. So that was roughly in the 1962, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, why is this guy doing this? Besides, it is a definitely a protest that everybody's going to remember. But it was a protest against GM because he was a Catholic that was making it very difficult uh, for the Buddhists to be able to practice their religion in a country that's predominantly Buddhist. All right? And so out of the Vietnam War, that is one of the most intense photographs taken. Um, let me show you this one. Girl fleeing napalm. Also, one of the seminal images of the Vietnam War. Anybody familiar with napalm? Yeah. And they would literally just, because they, you know, the soldiers would hang out in the tree lines, right? So if the United States forces were getting ambushed or whatever, they would say, well, we need to, we need to nape these areas. And they would come literally with gas, 
and the planes would literally just, you know, basically fume out the entire tree line because they believed that that's where the soldiers were embedded. All right. And those, obviously, those areas are surrounding villages. And so this poor girl um, is running for her life, basically, to flee the napalm attack. Um, okay, let me get the others just quickly. All right. Um, talked about Viet Cong. The South Vietnamese Army that the U.S. supported is called ARVN, A-R-V-N. Um, the NVA is known as the North Vietnamese Army. Does anybody know what the Gulf of Tonkin is? Yeah, but what did the resolution do and what was it based on? Gave us, didn't he give us authorization to enter South Vietnam? Right, to use military force. And that was LBJ, but that was in 64. And the belief was that the, the Vietnamese had fired on a ship in the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, so it's kind of like the remember the main of Vietnam um, and gave them the ability to start, you know, facility. Because we had advisors, but by then, you know, we were kind of now in full on military operations from 64 on. Anybody familiar with the Tet Offensive? Tet Offensive was a, a massive invasion from the NVA and, and basically all points that were under um, either US or South Vietnamese control including Saigon itself um, and this happened you know during this holiday that the Vietnamese supposedly there wasn't going to be nothing that would happen other than celebrations on that day. It's like their Fourth of July or something like that, and um, yeah, it basically was just saw massive invasions and very well organized. It didn't succeed militarily. I mean, the United States was was able to beat them back in pretty much every front, but it got on the news, and it's what convinced everybody that the war was not winnable. Okay, it's where the United States people pretty much gave up on the war. Like even a lot of the moderates, those that were not part of like the SDS or something like that, that they were now fighting against the war. Okay, um, how about the My Lai massacre? Are you guys familiar with that? Okay, yeah, and um, and that's. I mean, unfortunately, that's what happens when you are on you know, some kind of duty where you're going through and you don't know who the enemy is. It's not like they're all wearing, you know, the big shirt that says E on it for enemy. And so you know which people you're supposed to shoot. So if you're, you're occupying a village or something and you're looking for people that intelligence indicated might be, you know, Viet Cong, then you're going into a village and everybody seems friendly and supportive, you know, and they're, you know, kind of like, you know, they'll pick up the kids and have little photographs from, and then somebody will like grab a, a backpack and throw it into a helicopter and explode it. And now you just watch one of your brothers, you know, get, you basically die in front of you. And so the logic of that becomes every one of these bastards is VC, Viet Cong. So I'm going to kill them. Next ones I see. And so, it's definitely not defending that, but that's what ended up happening when you put people in an impossible situation where they don't know who the enemy is. Okay, and so you're going on some kind of, what can I think of the name of this? Where like a, a group of troops are going on, a, you know, some kind of mission or whatever that particular day. And your job is to, I don't know, like to at least determine that this village is free of Viet Cong, but you're not really sure. And then you're interrogating them, and then maybe one person moves too fast, and then you shoot that person. You know, and then all of a sudden, it, it like all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Was it discovered later that some of that the people that they killed during the Milo massacre were innocents? Like, was that discovered later? Or well, they killed everybody in the village. They tried to, yeah. I mean, eventually there was hearings, and yeah, there was definitely people that were, were brought up. There's a guy, his name is Lieutenant Callie. He was the one that was kind of the, the person that gave the orders. But, I mean, that was the worst possible thing that could happen in a really impossible situation is that when you hear stories about, 
you know, rapes or, you know, mass murder, but that's, those were some of the things. And then they get back to the people and then you're like, you guys kill babies. You know, you kill women and children. And you're, you're like, I can't describe to you what this situation was. All right. And I don't know that the person that I just handed like a lollipop to is the person that just passed along explosives that killed everybody in my you know, in my platoon, or whatever the case may be. So, um, just a bad situation. By the 19, late 1960s, uh, there was a, a way to try to exit from it, and that's, you know, it's called uh, Vietnamization. We wanted to turn over control of South Vietnam to the Vietnamese, and eventually it's done, okay? Um, it's the worst part of the idea that we could conflate every communist thing anywhere in the world as being like a Soviet directed move to take over the world okay um, we that was our you know the, the lowest point of the Cold War for us uh, the Soviet Union had a low point in the Cold War that was their invasion of Afghanistan um, that lasted throughout the 1980s and ultimately maybe uh, sought it probably was the, the end of the Soviet Union because of it um, but we, you know, it was hard for us to get out of Vietnam, all right, um, in a way that they would feel like, I mean, how do you do that? That's the other part. Like, because we saw Iraq, Iraq was like part two, all right? And a lot of people that have studied history are like, the same shit, I'm sorry, the same thing is going to happen, all right, because they don't really know what to do next, all right, so Saddam Hussein's out of the way now. You got, uh, well, you got Kurds, you got Sunni, you got Shia. Everybody's fighting for the prize. Um, everybody hates the United States. Every time the United States does something ornery, they're probably going to increase the number of people that get recruited into terrorist groups. Um, is it ever going to stop? You know? And, oh, if... Uh, Saddam Hussein didn't have weapons of mass destruction, uh, did not work with Al-Qaeda, then why the hell were we there? Um, and then all these people died. So you're going to have to like explain to some family member, hey, your kid died, we're not really sure why. Uh, the, the thing that we thought was gonna be true ended up not being true, all right? And if people had actually known that maybe Ho Chi Minh was not a Soviet-directed agent, that was looking for world takeover, then why did like everybody that enlisted in the army die then? You know, why am I watching these soldiers coming home every single day? You know, and so nobody in charge ever wants to be the one to say, my bad, probably shouldn't have done that. So you end up constantly looking for this perfect exit strategy that's never going to be there. So anyway, okay, Africa. Um, and there's a couple of stories about this. Um, for the most part, the British version of the Africa story is that Britain kind of saw the writing on the wall, meaning that they're no longer going to be a colonial empire. They started almost immediately uh, with, you know, releasing what India and Burma and a couple of other places. Um, and then their African colonies, they kind of transitioned them into what they call neo-colonialism. Like they were trying to prepare them for self-rule. They were still trying to hold on to economic contacts if they could. Um, but as far as like sitting in the ground and like fighting all the uprisings to the best of their ability, the British really weren't doing that. Okay, so there's not really a lot of evidence of you know, the British trying to hold on to their colonies in Africa, they were just looking to try to transition. That's not going to be the case for France. All right, so uh, the people that you see listed, a lot of them kind of follow, you know, the Gandhi platform, at least to some degree, where they've got Western education and are eventually going to use the Western education as a means uh, to fight for self-determination for their own folks. Uh, they had these Pan-African Congresses that began even before World War I. If you guys have ever heard of the uh, African-American intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, he was part of a group um, that spent time with a lot of these African colonial leaders um, 
looking for opportunity. Um, and then after World War II, the opportunity kind of came to bear. Um, and so I kind of gave you some names that are associated with some different, um, different areas. Um, the one that was really the saddest uh, was this region called the Congo. I think all of you are familiar with it. There's no place that had a worse experience with European colonialism than the Congo. Um, after the war was over, again, another leader um, who seemed to be somebody that was a spirit that the people could have gotten along with, he just happened to be on the left side. All right, his name was Patrice Lumumba. And Lumumba, um, they organized, you know, a little, um, same, like a Mossadegh kind of situation and got Lumumba out of there and replaced them with a pretty harsh dictatorship. A guy by the name of uh, Mobutu. And so Mobutu took over this region called Zaire. That's what it was called before it became the DRC. Um, but, you know, another dictatorship, another very harsh dictatorship um, that the U.S. could get behind, um, and it has the one thing that we loved in the Cold War was that it wasn't communist. All right, but not necessarily good for the people. Okay, South Africa, we know about that one. It's one of the last places that still had remnants of colonialism kind of tinged on it, and that's because of the apartheid regimes in South Africa. Okay, uh, it is its own place, but it was still a white minority controlled place um, that had like significantly segregated um, the white and the black populations um, and that was maintained until like the early 1990s like I can remember we didn't have a lot of stuff to protest when I was in college uh, but divesting from South Africa was one of those things because um, Mandela became very known at that time uh, as being a freedom fighter uh, for South Africa uh, to end the apartheid regime uh, and eventually he becomes their first post-apartheid leader. Okay, Portugal was the last to give up their colonies. That didn't happen until the early 80s. I don't know if that's trivial pursuit or whatever, but uh, Angola and Mozambique were the, like, the last African colonies standing, and they were both Portuguese colonies. So they were the first to come in and the last to leave, the Portuguese. All right. Um, and then Algeria, uh, and then we're going to take a little break if that's okay. Somebody just needs to push the stop button, maybe Bryce. And then we can hit a couple of things before we leave, because it's almost 8 o'clock. All right. Um, what happened in Algeria? How long has France been in Algeria? That's a trivia question. Anybody know? 1830. 1830, that's good. Okay. Who? Double the money. Who was the king in France in 1830? that went into Algeria? Louis-Philippe. <laughs> Not yet. Before Louis-Philippe. Oh, oh, hold on. Uh, Is it Napoleon II? Remember, they had a revolution in 1830, and the leader was a hardcore monarchist by the name of Charles X. Okay? He was an ultra-royalist, and they ended up having a revolution to overthrow him. But his, his government was so unpopular, he thought that he would be able to gain some popularity if they went into Africa, so they went into Algeria. One of the first moves in European imperialism in the 19th century was the French moving into Algeria. Okay, um, okay long story short, not only did the French go into Algeria, but they settled a large population of Europeans in Algeria. Okay, and they became known as the Pied Noir or Blackfeet. It was a, like kind of a racial, it had a racial tone to it. But the descendants of Europeans that kind of lived and grew up in Algeria, they had been there since the 19th century and they continued through, you know, this late, you know, post-World War II period. Okay? Algeria has a, like a Muslim dominated, you know, is a Muslim dominated state that is under French colonial control. They want their own country. Okay? It's a little more complicated, um, and kind of the same way that France wanted to stay in Indochina, there were French living in Indochina. 
Okay, they had become plantation owners and all that crap. Okay, they had assets and they had land and a whole bunch of things that they were trying to hold on to. More so in Algeria, including a large population that was fearful. Like, what happens if Algeria takes over? You know, if the government becomes independent and it's Muslim dominated, what happens to all the PA Noir? All right. So, with that in mind, uh, the French kind of stuck to maintaining control of Algeria and ended up blowing up into a very destructive war that lasted uh, through most of the 1950s and into the early 60s. And it also toppled the Fourth French Republic. Because France says like five republics, I think they're on the fifth one. All right. But the fourth one was created right after World War II, and it lasted until like the late 50s. And the Algerian crisis is ultimately why they ended up like bowing out of the Fourth Republic and giving more powers to an executive who would be able to deal with the Algerian crisis, and that was Charles de Gaulle. And when de Gaulle got in and saw Algeria and kind of saw what was going on, he's like, this is a loss. So we need to get out of this. We need to give them their independence. Okay? But here's the part that's important. The people that were living in Algeria... Muslims and others that were supportive of the French during the Algerian War, um, after Algeria gets its independence, where do they go? They go to France. There's a large Muslim population that resides in France, and it's created a lot of antagonisms between French Christians or Catholics French Muslims who have been like kind of identified almost as second-class citizens, and it's created a lot of problems. Okay, but that Algerian crisis kind of created a refugee situation uh, because of the way the French handled it. All right, but we, I mean, some of the things that have been going on the last couple of decades, um, and even like the introduction of right-wing politics in France. Um, some of that is a byproduct of the fact that you have a very large African population that lives in France. Okay. That left after this war was over. Okay. Um, just some stuff to kind of pay attention to. Um, it's just decolonization has not been the smoothest transition. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of scars from the European colonial era, uh, and a lot of states are still, still trying to find it. You know, um, Africa may be more than anybody. Because um, it's not like they left them this perfect apparatus that they could just grab uh, and then transition to. You know, there's a lot of ab abruptness uh, to their, to, to the, the, their uh, giving up their colonies. I mean, Britain at least tried, uh, but, you know, in some cases not very successfully. Okay. Um, and then, of course, as all of these, you know, these African states try to find their bearings and find, you know, what are they, how are they going to rule and, you know, who's going to be the candidates, uh, that all gets thrown into the Cold War cycle. So, you know, you name it, Mozambique, Angola, wherever, um, you know, the Soviets in the United States are looking at the developments and deciding which side they're going to be on. Okay. Um, anyway. Okay, let's, can we hit stop? It, can we hit stop and then hit replay? Yeah. All right. Um, or it's 8 o'clock. Have you guys had enough? Well, you, I just I had a couple of other things that I wanted to do, but we've been at it for two hours. Can we at least take like a five-minute stretch? Yeah. All right, let's yeah. do that. No, I'm excited to see them. All right, so. I'm sure you're sad. <laughs> What's sad that they're home? No, God no. Um, okay. There used to be a section in McKay that actually dealt with the civil rights movement, so I don't feel like I'm going to teach that that is U.S. history. Um, but it is there for you in case you care. Um, this is the stuff that I want to finish with, and it's the only thing that we're going to talk about, and then I'll pick up tomorrow in class with the stuff that, if you're here, um, with the other stuff that's in this set of notes. But it's called the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, 1945 to 1968. And it starts with Stalin, because Stalin is still in charge of the Soviet Union after the war ends for about eight more years. And the hope was, because it's so 
crappy to be in the Soviet Union under Stalin. That like the most joyful time to be in Stalin Soviet Union was during World War II, when they lost 40 million people. So those those were the most joyful times because prior to that it was purges and five year plans and collectivization and a whole bunch of death, and they got a reprieve from the death I guess by fighting in World War II. So then the belief is, all right, we, we, we're, we fought this great patriotic war. We defeated this Nazi war machine. We practically were doing it by ourselves until the middle of 1944. Um, we have liberated like a whole tract of European territory. We did it. So what do you say? You know, we get a little cake out, maybe blow out some candles or something, and Stalin's like, no, another five-year plan. Because remember, the doctrine of permanent revolution, he's got to keep it going. Got to keep the party alive. So he's got plans for another five-year plan. He's got another plan for purges. Right? Even on the eve of his death, he was under this belief, or he created this belief, that the doctors in the Soviet Union were plotting the overthrow of the regime. So he was going to purge the doctors. Okay? And unfortunately, he died. All right? for the doctors and everybody else. Um, he, not only was he doing all that domestically, but we know that he was fighting the Cold War pretty hard. Um, and it was almost like there was a little bit of a reprieve um, when that stopped. But I mean, if you look at the stuff like, you know, the fact that he went in and literally just purged um, the leadership that Czechoslovakia wanted to have for themselves um, after the war was over, um, the leader, uh, his name was Jan Masuric, um, and they executed him and put a hardline communist power uh, in its place. Um, the Berlin blockade, the creation of East Germany, um, you know, fighting some, you know, some of the stuff in the, in the Iron Curtain, replacing, you know, a lot of those states with hardline puppet governments. I mean, he did a lot of work. Um, and his death was probably like a big you know, sigh of relief for everybody. Um, Tito. Have you guys heard of Tito? Besides the vodka guy? Tito is referring to a guy named Joseph Tito. And in Yugoslavia, that's spelled J-O-S-I-P. But Joe Tito. All right? He's a leader. He's a communist. But guess what? He's not a Soviet-directed communist, which is probably part of the reason why he was so hardcore on Czechoslovakia is that Tito in Yugoslavia is like, we're going to be our own thing. And the one thing about it was that Yugoslavia was not liberated by the Soviet Union. They fought the Nazis on their own. And so after the war was over, yeah, they went to communism, but it was Tito's version of communism. And it should have taught the United States a lesson that not every communist is a Soviet-directed communist. For Christ's sakes, you had a guy that did that, that showed them the way, that there was an alternative, and that was Tito. And it really probably aggravated Stalin that he, that was the one that got away. But he was pretty hard line with everybody else, Romania, East Germany, Poland in particular, Bulgaria, uh, you name it. Um, he dies. Uh, and the person that took his place kind of just stepped back a little bit and said, all right, we, we survived that. And there's a speech that he gave, and it's actually in the McKay book, I believe, but it's called the 20th Party Congress speech. And it was supposedly a secret speech, but it ended up leaking out. All right. But that speech was almost like it dropped people's jaws because he got real with people. He's like, this guy was a criminal. Stalin, you know, it, like, he abandoned the revolution. Like, he was killing for the sake of killing. Like, we had already had the revolution. The Soviet Union was already created, yet this guy continued to purge. And this guy continued to, uh, you know, to arrest. And this guy continued to terrorize, literally for the sake of terrorism. And it was a reckoning with that. It said, he's dead now. And we all need to get away from it and become, you know, at least decent people again. All right, we need to let our peasants breathe. And we need to allow people to have a voice. 
And it's really scary. Remember that I gave you that Lysol on crap thing. Like he's take, he's it's kind of like he put the Lysol down for a second. He's like, oh shit! You know, like it's like, and then he grabs it again and starts spraying because it didn't react the way that he wanted it to. Like, and this is the problem in in, in Soviet Union. And I, I think that Vladimir Putin has kept my narrative alive. Um, but. He wants to go through this policy. You know, I want to. I want to relax. You know, some of the, the control that we have on the peasants. I want to be able to like open up new new land. You know, so that people can cultivate it and do better. I want to try to grow wheat, although it didn't really work out very well. All right. Um, I want people to be able to speak, and that led to you know some Nobel Prize winning literature from some really great writers. I want to relax a little bit on Eastern Europe. I want to, you know, try to create a, a peaceful coexistence with the United States. 